Welcome to the Keeping It Israel podcast with Jeff Feuders, where Jeff and his guests talk everything Israel as it relates to Christian faith and the church. If you are a Christian and you stand with Israel, you will be encouraged and challenged by this podcast. And if you're not so sure about the whole Israel thing, you need to learn how your faith connects with Israel and why standing with Israel matters. Now here's Jeff with today's guest. Well, welcome to the podcast again today. And uh, with me, as he was last week, is Gene Binder. Gene, welcome back. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, as I said before, it's our pleasure. And uh, we are talking about Gene's book, Connecting the Dots. And uh, if you didn't join us last week, Maybe you want to press pause and go back and, and either watch or listen to last week's episode, or you could just jump right in today and get the overview later. But uh, it's good to have you listening in. And uh, Gene, we're going to talk today about, about covenant, uh, this foreshadow of the covenant and how, um, how we can understand a little bit more about what God is doing, uh, you know, with, with building his family. Uh, as we sort of walk through this process. So introduce that for us and, uh, and share a little bit about what happens in the very beginning. Okay. Yeah. Just to remind everybody from, from last week that, you know, the book is built off of what we call seven foreshadows. So these are prophetic pictures of the past that get fulfilled in the messianic era that you and I live in now begin when Yeshua when Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, and they get eternally completed in God's final plan to build his eternal family in what's called New Jerusalem, and all these foreshadows play out as a trilogy, and um, just like Lord of the Rings was a trilogy meant to be in order, and maybe maybe just real quickly talk, uh, just go through these seven uh, foreshadows again just so people can see that they they build on each other and each one tells an amazing beautiful gospel story and so it begins with the covenant we're going to cover that today that is actually God's plan for uh, for marriage the covenant is um, is is patterned after a, a marriage it starts with an engagement and we'll see how it goes when we start here in a minute and once you have a marriage you usually have kids that would be the foreshadow of the nation of Israel. Once you have a marriage and kids, then you need a place to live. That would be the foreshadow of the promised land. And um, every, every a good family has a nice set of healthy rules they live by. That is the Torah or the law. Uh, the next one is the temple. And that is God's plan uh, being the ultimate heavenly father every good father knows you got to give your kids access and the temple is god's plan to give us access to him it starts out kind of weird in the back room of the of the temple but it gets better and better in each uh episode the sabbath is god's plan for for weekly family time and then the feasts are the annual fa family reunions they're all beautiful they all play out the same way in that trilogy pattern and the covenant is you know what a way to start with with uh god's plan for for a wedding for a marriage and it starts out as an engagement a lot of people um don't realize that the language that god uses in the tanakh in what a lot of people call the old testament um or the old covenant is language that's used very similarly to uh, what a husband would speak to his, his bride. And so in, in Isaiah 54, 5, it says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. <clears throat> in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, it's very steamy language here. I mean, if you actually read it in the original language, actually, it's pretty steamy just the way it is here in the NIV translation. But it says, I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, uh -oh, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. And so <clears throat> when we look at this first episode, we're looking at 
in engagement. And uh, this is, it's not the marriage, even though he's using this language, we're looking at an engagement part of this relationship. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, I have read the Old Testament or the Tanakh, as you say, I haven't read it in the original language, but, but I've read it a number of times. And the first time I read your book, uh, this marital language that you uh, extract from the text really kind of jumped out at me. I, you know, you, you read it over and, and either sometimes you go, oh, okay, well, that's, that's one way to describe it. Or, or you just kind of raise one eyebrow and go, huh. Uh, but, but don't really give it a whole lot of thought. So I appreciate the fact that you're, you're kind of helping us understand. I, I think it's so beautiful the the level of intimacy uh, that God has for his people, uh, that it shows us that uh, in the language that he uses. And, and this is going to get even, even better as you go along and, and explain this to us. Um, you talked about uh, that text in um, Ezekiel, I believe it is where, where God says, you know, he's going to, he's going to take and, and cover us, uh, you know, pull the, 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 uh, the garment over us, I believe, is the language. And um, it makes it always makes me think of Ruth and Boaz and their story. You know, Ruth knows that this man is to be her kinsman redeemer in, in Jewish tradition, uh, but they're not married. And she goes and waits for him, uh, you know, at the threshing floor. Talk a little bit about maybe how those things connect. Well, I mean, you know, again, the book of Ruth is also somewhat of a type for us. I mean, Boaz and Ruth will become married and they will give birth to a child and the Messiah will come through that lineage. And so, you know, God, whenever he tells these intimate stories, they, they almost always have a kind of a foreshadowing of, um, into the future as well. And this one certainly does. It, it's 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 important to know a couple of things about this covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, the Israelites. That first of all, it's it's an everlasting covenant. He says that several times in the book of Genesis. Repeats that over and over again, as if we need to hear it more and more to to mm. believe it. Because as we we talked about in that in last week in the first session of, about replacement theology, a lot of people think that God revoked his covenant promises to Abraham and his kids, but he didn't. He disciplined him. And there's a difference between discipline and judgment. Judgment is final, discipline is for our good. And so the two exiles that Israel experienced was, was to help refine them, not to take away the covenants. And, and it's important to know that in this first phase, which I think is the most important thing, is that it's just an engagement, but that an engagement in ancient Israel was binding. It took a certificate of divorce in order to, to get out of it. And the best place we can see this is, is the relationship between Joseph and Mary, Yosef and Miriam, uh, two right. young right. Jewish man and woman. You know, they're engaged, right? And um, they're not married. And Mary comes to Joseph with, a, with the Holy Spirit story that she's pregnant and like any of us, we wouldn't really buy that and Joseph doesn't buy it. And so it says that, it said Joseph, her husband was a righteous man when he heard this and he did not expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her. You see, so that's how, that's how serious it was to be engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, right, um, right. Yeah, and in this first episode, God is, is engaged to the Israelites, but they cheat on him. And they cheat on him multiple times. And it, and it breaks his heart. And um, which brings, it gets us to the story of Hosea that we'll talk about. Yeah, the story of Hosea is... Uh you know, such a, a heart wrenching story, because I mean, certainly for a guy, you know, a, a guy uh, reading 
Hosea is thinking, God, what are you up to? I, I mean, why would you put this poor man, uh, you know, through what you put him through? But but God had a reason. It's it's horrible. I mean, any man or woman who has had a partner um, cheat on them understands this is the worst experience that you can have. Mm -hmm. It crushes, and particularly for us men. Um, I mean, it, it crushes both genders, but us men, we take it so much harder. Um, and so he comes to this young Jewish man named Hosea, and then right in verse two in Hosea chapter one, verse two, he says, he said, go marry a promiscuous woman, have children with her. Like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness uh, to the Lord. And so he's even telling us right in the beginning that this, this horrible um, experience that Hosea has to have by, by taking on an unfaithful wife is patterned after the unfaithfulness that the Israelites have towards God. And of course, Gomer goes out and she does. She, she is unfaithful and they have some kids out of that unfaithfulness. And, um, you know, it's gotta be just excruciatingly painful for Hosea to be able to even see those kids every day and realize that those aren't, he's not really the father of those, those children broke his heart and yeah. so when we get to chapter two in Hosea God begins to rant I mean it's like a it's just a a broken-hearted rant and he he says in verse two in chapter two says rebuke your mother I mean this is just raw it's interesting because these are like raw emotions from the God of this universe you know he mm -hmm. says rebuke your mother rebuke her for she is not my wife i am not her husband let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts and he just goes on and he rants and he rants for several verses and um it's gut-wrenching but he, he finally gets to, to verse 19 and it's like you know we can imagine this was done over a period of time because as, as, as humans you know you can't get over this in 19 verses um it's going to take days exactly. and months and yeah. sometimes years and sometimes you carry those wounds forever but but god pauses at verse 18 or 19 and he says yet i will betroth you to me forever he remembers the covenant promise he made to israel it wasn't based on what they were going to do it was based on what he would do and he says i will betroth you in righteousness and in justice, in love and compassion, I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. It's, it's a beautiful love story, but right here, we're still at a very kind of uh, an engagement that's gone wrong. This is, he's looking, he says, I will betroth you. I mean, he said, I'm not betrothing you right this second, you know, right this second, I'm pretty angry with you. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's where we leave it in that first episode we leave it with a broken relationship it is a, a beautiful it's a beautiful picture though uh, that that god is is willing in that very very you know horrible circumstance that we talked about that he is willing to even uh, consider uh, betrothing us to himself be, you know having having uh, the relationship restored. And so it sets up that anticipation, doesn't it? Um, uh, you you told us last week about how all of these foreshadows, you know, go through the sort of the three episodes of, of history. Uh, and there's this uh, Old Testament period, and then the messianic fulfillment period. And eventually we get to, we get to um, prophetic, prophetic fulfillment in the end times. But, but, uh, Take us from, from here now, this picture of, of God putting it out there, there will be a day. Uh, what happens when, uh, when Yeshua comes on the scene? Well, the promises, you know, come even in the Tanakh, you know, Isaiah 118 says, though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Of course, Isaiah 53, that 
great messianic promise that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment mm -hmm. that brought us peace was upon him. This is the atonement that the Messiah is going to make for us that we know is Yeshua. It's, it's Jesus. So when Jesus comes, he, you know, in, in that first episode, it looks like the wedding's off and Jesus makes a way for the wedding to be on once again. This is how God demonstrates his love for us, Romans 5, 8, you know, that while we were still sinners, Messiah died for yeah. us. And so, and what's beautiful is this was all planned even before God pressed the play button in Genesis 1, 1. This was, he, he decided all this stuff in eternity past. And, and, the, and the most beautiful thing about this second episode is that if you know anything about an ancient Jewish uh, wedding, that it goes, through, it goes through three stages. So the first one is the covenant. It's a, it's a you know, the, uh, in a Jewish wedding, you make a ketubah. It's a, it's a contract to, you know, it's your promise. It's your pledge. It's your oath. And so that's stage one. The second stage is the preparation. Once the contract is made, the, 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 the groom and, and usually with, with his father, they've made, a, they've made a contract, they go back and the preparation now, he's gonna be preparing a, uh, a place for his bride to come in the bridal chamber. And then um, he'll finally go and get his bride where, wherever she's at, usually it's in a, in a town uh, maybe the next town or a little bit further away, but then the bride is retrieved and they come back for that wedding feast. Jesus fulfills. Now in those three stages, there are 12 steps and Jesus fulfills every single one of them in, in, in the, the Brit Chadashah, in the New Testament. And um, I, can I share just a few of them with you? Cause they're just, they're amazing. I won't go through all 12, Please, I'm not surprised that he fulfills them all, but uh, you know that's that's just that's the beauty of of uh, Messiah and and how he fulfills so much of what we read in in the uh, Tanakh. But but yeah, please share some of those. Sure, I'll just 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 a few of them. So so the first one is is the bride selection, and so that's usually it's it's the it's the groom along with his father, and they go. And they're going to meet with the family. Most of the time, this was already arranged, and um, and so this was just a formality. We're going to come and we're going to make a a, a ketubah, a contract, um, and we're going to select the bride. And, and but it says in Ephesians one four, but God chose us. He selected us in Messiah before. Here we said this just a little bit ago before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight, like. It's what we call the bride of Christ, right? The unstained yeah. bride of Christ. That's that's us. Um, and so, and Jesus said in John 15, 18, you did not choose me, I chose you. I selected you. And so right out of the shoot, we get Jesus fulfilling the first step. Um, a lot of people have it wrong that there was no choice for the bride, but there, but there was. And, um, and just like with us, God doesn't force us to have a relationship with us. We have to make some kind of acknowledgement that we want to accept his offer. And of course, Romans 10, 9 says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God raised from the dead, we will be saved. So we, we can't get into this relationship with Jesus unless we consent. Um, mm -hmm. so there's, there's two. Now, so the, 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 the father and the son, they, they, they select the bride, they get her consent, and then there's uh, a bride price, um, a dowry, so to speak. And, um, you know, they would, they would negotiate like, you know, I'll give you 25 chickens and six goats, you know, deal, all right? That's, <laughs> that's how it is. And it's yes. the same thing with Jesus, First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Messiah. And 1 Corinthians 8.20 says, you were bought at a price. So that's pretty cool, you know, that we, we've already got, there, there's, there's several more here, but this is in that first 
covenant stage. Um, the last thing that they usually do together before the, the groom and his father leave is they, the groom would take a glass of wine and give one to his future bride and they would hold it up and they would make a promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine until the wedding feast. Ah, and he's okay. done in years. Is, is, is that like jog your memory about a verse here? Yeah, Jesus, yeah. My mind runs right ahead. Jesus at a Passover Seder, the, the last one, of course, before his his um his death and resurrection. He's with his disciples. He he gives thanks. This is um, Matthew 26, 27, and 29. He gives thanks. He gives wine, a, a cup of wine to everyone. Of course, that's what you do in a, if you've ever been to a Passover Seder. There's lots of wine, lots of sips of wine. That's true. So it was so with Jesus. But this is what he says. Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant. This is him setting up what we call communion today, right? The meaning of communion, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And here's, here's the part that connects to this, this step just before he leaves. I tell you the truth, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom in that final episode. Beautiful, beautiful. And so, something else, something else that you, you didn't mention, but I want to, I'll just go back and mention it quickly. I loved when I read the part about the ketubah, the fact that this document was written more to protect the bride's interests than it was to protect the interests of the groom. Yeah, not many fathers are going to let their daughter get into a situation that is going to burn them. And um, you're exactly right about that. Yeah, it's but it says it, it says something as well about the fact that that we are the bride. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, that the, the price that Messiah paid was so dear, you know, that, and that it was paid so that um, for the forgiveness of, of many, uh, that's, that's a wonderful picture. Yeah, no, I'm glad you pointed that out. It, it makes it really elevates the, um, the cost and God's incredible love for us mm. through sacrifice himself in order that we would be protected yeah good observation amen carry on so so after that the the groom and the father leave and they go back to their town and um the main job usually the the husband's still living at home in fact most of the time the the husband and bride will continue to live in in the father's home and his job is to prepare the bridal chamber um, you know, back then there was no ceremony like we do today. In fact, in fact, Jewish and Christian weddings are patterned after this, where, where there's an entourage that comes down and, and there's a ceremony under what's called a, what, what's this called where they're under? Hoppa. Hoppa. Yeah. You got to get that guttural sound. Yeah. Uh, you I'm working on, on it. <laughs> spit on the person in front of you. But a chuppah, now it's an awesome word. It shows up three times, three times in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. The first time applies to what we're talking about. It says in Joshua 2.16, it says, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. That word for chamber is chuppah. And the reason they're using chamber there because this is the bridal chamber. This is where the 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 marriage will be consummated. Um, and so when, when, when um, after, after, the, uh, after the bridal chamber is complete. Now, the second place that we see it is actually a really beautiful passage. And there's no way anybody would know that the word chuppah is even being used because that's not the word that's translated. But it's one of the most beautiful pictures about how God is a chuppah, a chuppah over us. And it's Isaiah 4, 5 through 6. And it says, then the Lord will create 
over all of Mount Zion. So Mount Zion is, is, the, is the Temple Mount area, right? And over all those who assemble there, a cloud of smoke by day and a glowing of flame, flaming fire by night over everything, the glory will be a canopy, a canopy, a chuppah. Now here's mm. the best description what follows, the sentence that follows is the best description of what a chuppah is because this was, it's a bridal chamber, but it was the bride's bedroom and there is no safer place on earth short of the womb than our bedrooms. You know, I don't know about, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm stressed, you know, I wanna to go to my bedroom, it's the quietest place in my house it's the safest place and it was true for a bride or for a groom here's what god says about this and this is verse six that follows this canopy description it will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and the rain Isn't that awesome beautiful beautiful it, it, yeah a beautiful thing it really is. And then, um, of course, when the bridal chamber is complete, um, the groom is going to go get his bride. And kind of interesting here. Now, this is, this is probably one of the most exciting verses. When the groom is, is, is getting the bridal chamber ready, it's not up to him to decide when it's finished and when he could go get his bride. It says here in John chapter 14, two through three, it says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you. So this is a picture Jesus is giving for us to go and prepare our chuppas. And, um, but in Matthew 24, 36, it says, no one knows about that day or the hour not even the angels in heaven, nor the son. Only the father knows the timing of when Yeshua will come back to gather us. And um, you can see how these, these stages are just being built one upon the other. And Jesus is fulfilling each yeah. one of them. Yeah, that, that observation in your book kind of blew me away a little bit because, I, you know, again, you, you read these texts over and over and over again. Uh, I don't know that I ever sort of, sort of caught the significance, uh, you know, that, that Yeshua himself does not know when the Father will send him back uh, for his bride. And this comes right out of the, again, the, this Jewish bridal process or ceremony that uh, it was also true of of the uh, of an ancient groom that he would prepare until such time as his father told him, right? Yeah, can't you just imagine going now, Dad? I mean, come on, come on, now. I exactly. Just... Yeah. Jesus saying the same thing. Come on, it's been two thousand years. I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Phenomenal. Yeah, it's, Phenomenal. It's, it's actually quite, quite beautiful. And I don't know, it's, it's, it, it's really, um, is, is you really, one of the things that hit me when I was writing this book is all these, all these foreshadows were following these patterns, each one telling a beautiful gospel story is like, who could put this all together? I mean, if you're struggling with a belief that God exists, just look at these seven foreshadows and say, who could put this all together over such a long period of time? And they all fit so beautifully together. So we get, so, so with that, we get to the final episode. So we had an engagement that went wrong. It's back on again through the reconciliation of Jesus shedding his own blood for us, but there still has to be a wedding, right? I mean, if this is going to follow the pattern, we've got to have a wedding. Well, actually we have to have a party because that's really what the wedding was. And so when the father says go, he usually takes, you know, his, a lot of his family and friends and they form this big entourage and they're blowing shofars, you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, along the way. And they get to the, to the town where the, 
the bride is there and she, they put her on that little, I always forget the name of that contraption where they have poles and she sits on top and they carry mm -hmm. her back and they're, they're blowing the shofar. And you get this kind of visual picture as they're, as, as they're coming to her town of that parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew 25, right? There's this bride, yeah, she's right. been engaged. The groom has gone away and um, she knows he can come back at any time up to a year and she's not gonna stay in her wedding dress the whole time. She wants to look good when he comes. So she gets this idea, I'll ask 10 of my friends who are virgins to go wait. And you, you can see how this all connects to the, when you get this beautiful Jewish context, you can see how it all fits together. Um, but he comes back with this entourage blowing horn, horns. Well, we see this in First Thessalonians 4. 16 and 17 it says so when yeshua comes back it says for the lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of god that's going to be it and when he comes roaring in on that cloud there's going to be a bunch of trumpet blasts or shofar blasting uh, as he comes with his entourage of angels you see how it's just such a beautiful picture he's going to grab his bride here's where we we have to stop thinking theologically and think of a think of it as a story because if you start thinking theologically well is this the rapture you know is the is there where's the tribulation fit in well i'll let theologians discuss all that i'm just looking at it as a story and uh, in that story we get a picture of the wedding feast and it's in revelation chapter 19 verse six through seven, and then verse eight and nine. And here's the picture that we get <clears throat> from John, where he gets this incredible picture of what this scene's gonna look like. He says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, which is awesome, a great mm -hmm. multitude. A lot of folks are gonna be there. Like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder shouting hallelujah. For our Lord God almighty reigns, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why? For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That ancient, That's it's amazing. In, that ancient, in the ancient Jewish wedding, if you just get back to that for a second, the bride and the groom go into the bridal chamber. They consummate the marriage. The, um, there's usually the best friend that's standing by the door waiting to tell everybody, okay. And they, they come out and it's a week long party. This is where Jesus, what Jesus was doing in, in Cana when they were running out of wine, right? Mm -hmm. And he makes all this wine for barrels full. And, um, and, they were, and it's at the end of the wedding. So I don't know, it could tweak everyone's thoughts about about wine and and uh, and how um, it plays into these celebrations, but we Jews, you grew up. Every Jewish celebration has wine included in it, and this one, remember, Jesus hasn't had any wine for however long this is going to be, and he'll probably have an incredible toast to make. Yeah, so it's an for sure. It's an amazing foreshadow, telling an incredible gospel story about God's unconditional and everlasting love that no one can take away from us. Yeah, Neither absolutely beautiful. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you've been married and you're in a, a, a good marriage, uh, this should make you even more excited about, uh, about being the bride of, of Yeshua. And one day all of that is going to culminate in the great marriage supper of the lamb. Um, well, you know, Gene, um, I don't, I don't know who listens to these often. Uh, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess, but I would say uh, that if you're listening today and uh, you don't, you don't know Yeshua, man, this, this is, one of the clearest illustrations of what the father has done for his children. And, you know, it's, it's clear throughout scripture, I believe, you know, that God chose the Jewish people 
but he chose them in order to bless all of the nations that through the Jewish people, the Messiah would come and that uh, God's intention always was for us all to end up being one great big family. And so whoever you are out there listening today, this is not just a Jewish story. Uh, it comes to us through the, the, the beauty of the Jewish marriage feast and through the Jewish Messiah. But uh, he stands ready uh, to invite you to be a part of his bride. And all you need to do is ask. All you need to do is, uh, Gene, you mentioned it earlier, you know, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and, uh, and you'll be saved. Confess that, that Jesus is Lord and believe that, uh, that God has raised him from the dead. And so, um, hey, just throwing that out there today. And uh, glad to have you listening. Anything more you want to say about uh, this bridal foreshadow before we sign off for this week, Gene? You know, I just think, and just, just to follow up what you just said, I, I think the, the one fundamental need that we all have is, is to be loved. And it's not always easy to find that in this right. life. And here is a lover that has pursued us before the beginning of time. And, and, and if, if it's that moment, you know, like for me, and I, I imagine it happened for you the same way, at some point, you're not thinking about that. And all of a sudden you are that, oh my gosh, the God who created this universe thought of me before he pressed the play button in Genesis 1. Nobody's mm -hmm. gonna love you as much as God loves you. And it is all about when you confess and believe in your heart, it's really about just giving yourself to that love, responding back, giving your consent, just like it was in that one of those stages. Yeah, nothing better you can do in life. Amen. Beautiful. Well, Gene, thanks for being with us this week. And uh, we look forward to hearing next week about the Torah. We're going to skip a couple of the foreshadows, right? But uh, we'll get you to recap at the beginning of next week again, so that we sort of know where we are. But uh, we don't want to give it all away because we want people to buy your book. And uh, just remind folks how they can pick this up again. Let us uh, have your website information and we'll make sure that we post that and uh yeah the best deal you're going to get is on my website which is bold journey bold journey all all together no dots or spaces dot com boldjourney.com backslash books and make sure you do plural on the books and there you'll you be able to learn more about the book and find out how to how to pay for it awesome so make sure that you uh Go out to Gene's website, boldjourney.com uh, slash books. And uh, I know that uh, he'd appreciate you picking up a copy, but not because of the money, but because uh, he's just really passionate about what is communicated in here. And uh, I know that because he said that last week. And I also would love for you to get the book because this really um, was tremendous when I discovered it. Uh, back a couple of years ago. And so God bless you. Thanks for uh, being with us on the podcast today. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week about the Torah. Well, thank you for tuning into the podcast today. And I hope that you enjoyed our talk about covenant and uh, just the wonderful connection between God's love for his children, God's love for you and I, and uh, how that is, how that is uh, foreshadowed in the covenant that God had with Abraham and the Jewish people, how that Jesus comes and fulfills it as he calls his bride to himself and, uh, and gives himself for us. And that one day, when we are all together at the marriage supper of the Lamb, this will be uh, this this wedding, this engagement will be consummated and God will welcome us into his family. What a, what a wonderful picture. And I know that uh, you're going to want to go and purchase Gene's book. We're going to give you that information once again. His uh, website is boldjourney.com slash books, plural, boldjourney.com slash books and the best deal for you to be able to uh, pick up a copy of his book connecting the dots uh, is there on his website and so we want to make sure that you make uh, 
arrangements to be able to get that book because I got to tell you, we're just scratching the surface uh, as we talk together about these things. And next week, we're going to talk about the foreshadow of the Torah and uh, how that God has put rules in place for his family. And uh, we'll look at that together. I do want to remind you that we are a ministry. First Century Foundations is a charitable organization here in Canada and in the United States who is helping ministries in the land of Israel. We also have our media ministry and and other things that we do. But uh, we are so grateful for people who engage with us. If you enjoy this podcast, if you've ever watched our television show, uh, seen any of our media on YouTube, and you appreciate what you're hearing, what you're learning, then uh, maybe you want an opportunity to be able to give back to our ministry. And I want you to know that uh, when you do that, your gifts go towards helping us to achieve the purposes of our ministry and helping ministries in the land of Israel. So uh, go ahead to our website, firstcenturyfoundations.com forward slash donate. And we would love to hear from you. And thank you so much again for listening, for tuning in. And we hope to see you, uh, have you listen in next week as Gene and I talk about the foreshadow of the Torah. And it is going to be great. You're going to really enjoy this. So make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for being with us. And remember, as Christians, we stand with Israel.